My name is Steve Berman. I own and run Lethe Press, and I am valet to Tyler, who runs Tyler Khan. Um, Tyler knows that in a few minutes he has to inspect some tuna, so he'll be back. Meanwhile, I'm excited about tonight's panel, which is on weird fiction. So we'll talk about writing weird fiction, talk about what is weird fiction, what could possibly not be weird fiction. I love weird fiction. I love weird things. So in a few moments, we'll start. Thank you. I thought I would take a moment to talk about books, or at least one book. Um, a new thing before each panel starts would be for me to recommend a book that I feel is sort of in the vein of the subject matter. So um, today, Karen Russell's, well, Vampires in the L Lemon Grove, sorry, it's backwards on this camera. Um, was New York Times bestseller, and there's a reason. I, I love these stories. Um, they're really sharp, they're compelling, they're strange. And so if you're in the mindset to find a great read, I do recommend Karen Russell's work. Um, and this is her short story collection. So again, Vampires in the Lemon Grove and other stories. And we will start our panel in a few moments. And we're back. And here we have my esteemed guests who will be on our panel talking about weird fiction. And please, panelists, would you introduce yourself? Let's start with, with Sonia. Hi, my name is Sonia Tafe. I write short fiction, poetry, film criticism, uh, my most recent book, through extreme coincidence, happens to be Forget the Sleepless Shores, published in 2018 by Lethe Press. It is a very good cross-section of the sort of things I write in that you get a lot of the sea, a lot of queerness, a lot of Jewishness, a lot of deep time, ghosts, history, ways in which people tell themselves stories about the world which may or may not have anything to do with construing the shape of the actual world, but hey, we've got to do something. And uh, as long as you're all stuck at home, you should please run out and buy it. Uh, God knows my personal economy could use it. Okay. <laughs> Adam? So my name is Adam McComber. Uh, I write weird fiction and horror, short stories, novels. Uh, my newest, coming out from Lethe Press, is Jesus and John. Uh, it's kind of a queer retelling and a queering of uh, the New Testament. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Will? Hi there, uh, I'm Will Ludwigson. Um, I am also a Lethe author. I am the proud owner and writer of these two books, Acres of Perhaps and In Search Of. Um, I write weird fiction, usually tinged a little bit with um, crime and alternate history. And last but certainly not least, Ruthanna. Hi, I'm Ruthanna Emrys. Um, I am also by coincidence uh, an author and my most recent book from I think last year, but it's hard to tell because time has stopped working, is Imperfect Commentaries, which is a short story collection and um, weird fiction, creepy languages, the sea, my problems with academia, um, and Jewishness, all sorts of things. I'm also the author of the Ends of Legacy series, starting with Wintertide. <laughs> and you do a snazzy panel, or not panel, column for Tor.com. Yes, I also uh, co-write the Lovecraft reread column on Tor.com, and I should have remembered that since I literally just handed in our latest column. I work with uh, Ann M. Pilch 
Anne M. Pillsworth on that, who is an author of the rare sub sub genre of Lovecraftian YA. <laughs> Whoa, and, and it, it is a it is a terrific column, and I think that. It is impossible to discuss weird fiction without mentioning HBL. So, um, but he won't, he's not the totality of the, of the field. He's not so, the totality of the column either at this point. <laughs> it's true. So uh, I, we all have beverages. Uh, I'm again pouring. Um, Metamucil? No, no, Tranya. It's blue, <laughs> blue Tranya. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's it's just gin that's not blue when it came out. You know, the first time I bought it, I thought that it would also be all blue, but and I was very disappointed. So That is, that is disappointing. Mm -hmm. and, and because I don't know how to drink well, uh, I have no idea if I pour too much. Like, my last, I think, it was either, it was either my interview with Adam or another panel, I... I poured the entire glass full of gin, forgetting to put the soda. It was with me, Steve, yes. Ah, there you go. It's so, um, a very Victorian life decision. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Tyler's questions, if we're ready. Um, how can I legitimately call the fiction I write, the hypothetical I, um, weird? Is one person's weird fiction just another man's horror? Um, or is it just dark fantasy and with literary pretensions? How do you know you are writing a weird fiction story? The weird I've always been rather fond. The known is not the true weird fiction. <laughs> <laughs> no, I so mean, we had oh, like. At the last Necronomicon, which is a big convention on weird fiction, several panels turned into discussions of what is weird fiction, um, including panels that were not on that topic. Um, and the conclusion that I came to was, if it is, there's a type that's really legitimately violating people's ideas about how causality and reality work, which has to change from time to time because what our, our ideas of causality and reality are not early 20th century ideas of causality and reality. But we also grandfather in anything that includes Cthulhu or Shaga theme or any of those things. But, you know, you don't know if you're writing it. <laughs> Your, your, your comments, Steve, about, you know, is, is my weird fiction somebody else's horror? I've always been fond of the formulation that my weird fiction is somebody else's Tuesday, or their weird fiction is my Tuesday. And, and there, that's, one of the, that's one of the features rather than bugs I've found of the contemporary explosion of what we have consensus defined as weird fiction, which is that you have so many different ways of looking at the uncertainties of the universe that are this kind of like radial, you know, Cambrian explosion out from, I mean, that, I guess that's making Lovecraft sound like a bony fish or something. Um, but the- <laughs> I think the, the, that's the what his wife said. Yeah, the, the, the Lovecraft Blackwood mode of, of weird fiction represents a very narrow path of this is what the world is and when we stray beyond that oh my god i didn't know that was a thing you could do that has deformed all of my expectations of causality and time and then like i think everybody on this panel can look at some of that and be like yeah so next and and i find that very valuable and i agree that the weird has a very nebulous definition which is probably appropriate because if you could taxonomize it properly it wouldn't be that weird at all but I, I really like the fact that you can get so many different refracting points of view of people going, that's not right. I think that, you know, you, one of the uh, Supreme Court justices talking about pornography back in the day said that you know it when you see it. And I think with weird fiction, you know it when you don't quite see it. Mm. Like, you corner of your eye and kind of obliquely 
hard to discern and detect. You know, I, I don't, for me, there are true crime books that feel weird. There are TV shows that feel weird. There are fantasy stories and science fiction stories. You know, something like Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke has a certain amount of weirdness to me that, that just kind of gives me this disquieting sense of not being who I am and where I am is kind of what I, I think of when I think of weird fiction. And I don't usually deliberately make weird fiction. It just kind of happens and other people accuse it of being weird. So I'm like, okay, that's, that's fine. I guess I can't prevent that from happening. So, so yeah, I, I don't know. It's one of those things like I never sit down deliberately to write a weird story. It just seems to be kind of what naturally comes from me. Like I'm, I'm legit trying to write literary fiction, man. I just think I'm John Irving. I don't know what everyone else is seeing in my stuff, but I'm doing the best I can with what I've got, man. I think that's really interesting, Will. I read somewhere that weird is not a genre, it's essentially a point of view, right? So it's a perspective on the world. Uh, and I definitely share that perspective as well. Whenever I talk about weird fiction with students, I always talk about the word slipperiness. Uh, there's a lot of slipperiness in weird fiction in a lot of different ways, like surface versus depth. Um, I've been thinking a lot about Lacan recently, like the symbolic order versus the real. So the real is always trying to creep up uh, through, you know, the symbols that society has constructed. Uh, it won't stay buried. I like the idea of, of weirdness as the reality that won't stay buried. I, one of the things that tends to happen when I get asked about weird fiction is that I talk about noir, both film noir and noir fiction. Um, I, in, in my life, which does not involve publishing books with Life Day Press, I write film criticism, I have a Patreon. Um, and one of the things that happened about four and a half years ago was I fell very hard into film noir. And I realized that that's because it's a genre of uncertainty. If you want a genre in the 40s and the 50s that provides the counterweight to the production code white picket fence of, you know, here is, here is the heteronormative white American Protestant world where we know exactly how everything works and what kind of, of person everyone is supposed to be and the people who stray beyond these ticky boxes are severely punished for their transgressions by this weird Catholic graft that we got stuck onto the studio system. Um, film noir is where you go for that. It's the genre where everything drops out from underneath you. One, one moment you're having a perfectly ordinary day and the next minute you're wrapped up in a surrealistic murder plot that feels like a nightmare come to life. You can't trust your friends, you can't trust yourself, you can't trust the institutions of the country you live in. The American dream can bite you in the ass harder in film noir than any other genre. I know from those otherwise very strictly regulated decades. And that's part of the, re and I love them, I think, for part of the reason that I love weird fiction. There is always the sense that the world whose surface you interact with is not the world that exists. And you can skate along for a while on the surface, but sooner or later something is going to give way and you are going to be confronted by all of the traps and strangenesses and non-alignments of the world in which you actually live. So I, I really like your Lacanian interpretation. I, I love the idea of reality seeping up, you know, as d despite our best efforts to put masks on top of it and make everything very hermetically safe. That's a contemporary metaphor, sorry. <laughs> so um, it's um, following something that has been mentioned, whether it be noir, Ghosts. These are these are mysterious elements, um, and so how important in a weird fiction story is it that we do not solve the mystery? Because does it by then? You know, I'm not saying that the ghosts are pulled off and it's old man Smithers. You know, and, and but but that more quantifying um, the mystery robs some of the weirdness of from the story. A lot. I mean, I, I, no. Go classic, ahead. Go ahead. A lot of classic weird fiction is about solving the mystery, and that solving the mystery does not resolve to a neatly comfortable universe the way it does in a mystery. 
you know, there's a, an anthology that is Sherlock Holmes Lovecraft crossovers, and almost none of them work, and then there's an award-winning Neil Gaiman story. And the reason it's very difficult to make them work is because it's all about restoring a rational universe through revelation, and Lovecraft is all about breaking through the facade of a rational universe through revelation. As long as you don't solve the mystery, which he thinks is eminently desirable not to solve the mysteries and says so several times, you can live with those illusions. But, and you can do weird fiction, I think, where you don't solve the mystery as long as it's clear that whatever the solution is, is not a comfortable one. Mm -hmm. Will, you were... I think that a, sol a solution in most weird stories, or in some of my stories for that matter, is kind of a pause where you've given up briefly your continued digging for answers, where you're like, well, I'm better stop here. This is what this will be a good enough solution for right now, because I don't, I can't face any other deeper layers of the onion. So I think that that's kind of, I, I, when I think of whether there's a solution or a, or a, or a revelation at the core of a, of a weird story. I don't know that there, I, th I think there's only like a, a, a temporary one, a, a, you know, a kind of a, a, you know, one that's, that's kind of provisional, you know, without being, you know, imposed. For, I mean, if, if, you, if there is a solution, it's your best guess, and it's probably wrong, and the only reason you've decided to call it a solution is because it is remotely comforting. I think that maybe it doesn't matter for me. Like, if you solve the mystery, it, it doesn't matter, right? I'm thinking about Agent Cooper um, solving the, the murder of Laura Palmer, you know, but that essentially doesn't matter in the end because he is consumed and washed over, you know, by the mystery itself, right? He is kind of, um, I don't know, mutated by it, something like that. So, yeah, it feels like it doesn't matter if you solve the mystery. It's still somehow consuming you. I, I think, uh, I don't necessarily think of weird fiction in terms of mysteries to be solved. Um, I don't know if I necessarily have an, a platonic ideal of a shape for a weird fiction story, but I think about a lot of them as being much more like bearing witness than about, they, they can involve figuring out what happened. Um, I do agree that, that you can dovetail weird fiction and crime fiction really well, just for that idea that's been mentioned, the idea that even if you figure out what happened, you know, you, there, there's no exorcism, there's not necessarily justice, there's, you, being able to say what happened isn't going to solve the problem of the thing that exists or the thing that is real. Um, and a lot of that is very powerful and very resonant. But I also feel that there's a branch of weird fiction which in many ways um, boils down to, can you believe that shit? And I think that that's also very important, just the idea that you could glance up against something which gives you this revelation of a world beyond the world that you know, and it doesn't, you, there's nothing to do with it. There's no morals to be drawn, you know, you can't learn any lessons from it other than maybe, you know, oh, oh, wow, if I'm the sort of person who finds the, the vastness of the universe terrifying, I'm even more upset than I was when I started this story. Or possibly you're the sort of person who likes, yeah, I am insignificant. Oh, God, I feel so much better about everything. But, but, but a lot of it is simply just like how close, you, how close you, your comet can come to the sun of the, of the strange world that exists and be able to get away unscathed or not at all unscathed and what you're then doing is telling the story and it just virally perpetuates itself and everybody who hears it is just like oh geez that 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 is weird one thing that always throws me out of a lovecraftian story at the end when a when a character learns some great truth about the universe and goes mad is i i cannot imagine a truth that would make me go mad. Like if you told me you're not the center of the universe, I'm like, no shit. <laughs> Human beings are insignificant insects. Yeah, no kidding, man. We know this. You know, <laughs> can't imagine. You know, we're the only creatures in the universe. I mean, I don't. I don't. I literally cannot conceive of what sort of revelation would make me go, holy. Shit. I'm like, I would just completely ruin me. I, I almost everything. Be like, huh? Who knew? I mean, I, it really. I cannot imagine. I mean, I, mean, I, I could go out on a limb and. I, I could go out, go out on a limb and say that this may suggest that you are somewhat um, 
emotionally healthier than H.P. Lovecraft. Maybe. Well, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's not make any assumptions. But uh, you know, admittedly, I am not living with my, my matronly aunts in the background. Like, <laughs> you know, I think that would be a good blurb for your next book. You know, <laughs> so is marginally <laughs> more healthier than Lovecraft. I, I will put my name to that. <laughs> marginally emotionally healthier than H.P. Lovecraft. I, I was thinking that you were going to suggest that he was a psychopath and thus doesn't have any sense of, you know. Well, no, I mean, I'm, I'm one of the people for whom Lovecraft's cosmicism, which I, while I find it really compelling, it doesn't function as horror. I happen to, mm. I, I happen to be one of the people who finds an immense source of comfort in the idea that there is going to be a planet and a solar system and a universe for quite some time after I'm gone. Like, yes, okay, entropy is real. As far as we know, the heat death of the universe is real. But I would be extraordinarily upset to find out when this is all over that I was actually solipsistic enough that everything just snuffs out. I mean, that, that's horrifying. I'm not cool with that. I, I, I spend a lot of time around the, when I can, at the moment I'm spending a lot of time around my books, um, you know, around things that give me that sense of deep time. The ocean is very important to me for that reason. Obviously, Ruthanna, you cannot relate to this at all. I don't, I don't even know what I'm saying. But it's... Yeah. One of the things that I really like seeing in weird fiction is bringing in characters who react in all of these different ways to these things. To, the, to me, the question of why do some people find these things mind-breaking, heartbreaking, and other people find them comforting? I want to see those people in a room reacting to the great cosmic thing that just came out of the ocean, and I want to see them talking about it and maybe to it and see what happens after that. Mm. Yeah, I, I think I would be freaked out less by a deep one than half the people I saw at Walmart during the quarantine rush. I, I think, you know, I, like I, I'm, not, I'm not super, I don't know, it would take a lot to shock me about the limits of biology or psychology or cosmology. These ones know how to social distance properly. Yeah, yeah exactly. If it's a big place, it would help. <laughs> All right, so Tyler's next question. Um, so weird fiction, uh, like many genres, has a terrific history, such as authors like E.T. Hoffman, Arthur, Ar Arthur Macon, Margaret Irwin, St Stefan Grabinski. So the interesting, so at least in my generation, we would read um, anthologies that reprinted these these authors, um, you know, Lovecraft, Blackwood, etc. And many of those stories, to me, what I loved, they were, I'm going to refer to them as cozy horrors, <laughs> in that, you know, this was not much shedding of blood, but there was, you know, terrible things happened, and people were killed, but it was so... You know, it, w it was both removed and intimate. And so I'm just curious, do we still have the cozy horror? Is part of your definition of cozy the same as it is in cozy mystery, which is that everything at the end is wrapped up? Because I thought our previous definition of the weird has just established that if you're not standing around with a handful of loose ends, you've done it wrong. No, I, I will say that how I think of cozy as, cozy as um, these are, you know, a lot of the elements of these early stories were the, 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 the narrator that was removed socially from the norm. They often dealt with, um, it was the, the, academics or the home, you know the amateur academics the genealogists they, yes. I thought it was a genealogist look how you taking a bicycle tour of new england to find out your roots yes 
but, or, or a lot of those trappings, like I know what you, I think I see where you're going with this, like the kind of, you know, here's the crumbling ruins of some mysterious past. And here's like, there, to me, at least when I think of a cozy, I think about, you know, what would I like to find in the woods? <laughs> or what would I like to read about? And, you know, that kind of, that yes, it's weird. And yes, it's strange, you know, like Sticks by Carl Edward w uh, Wagner, you know, that, that kind of that, Yes, there's something weird, something horrifying there, but there's also something kind of weirdly, um, I don't know. Rustic. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it takes place in small villages. This mm -hmm. is not an urban thing. It is not very, obviously there's not much sex. There's not much, there's even not much violence. Um, so I, I, I'm just thinking, is does this exist in the weird fiction of today? Or is it just too much a... Uh, a part of of the the period in which these stories were written. I think soft spoken weird fiction absolutely does still exist. Um, I I think I would suspect that nowadays, if you are writing sort of a club story weird fiction with the frame narrator, you know, or the I heard this from this guy who I ran into in town the other day it will be seen as having some element of throwback or pastiche, but I think I have quite certainly read things I would consider weird fiction, which have that tone of slight remove or that almost anecdotal quality, which don't require the structural trappings in order to um, work without like Shoggoths exploding all over the screen. Mm -hmm. Adam, you look like you're about to say something. No, I'm just nodding and thinking. <laughs> I mean, it's an interesting concept. I was thinking of M.R. James earlier when you were uh, when you were talking about the the kind of rustic and you know the horror beneath that. I love M.R. James, but certainly he's not a contemporary writer. I'm trying to think of anything. I mean, Saruman, sorry, uh, Saramanette's the Bone Key. Her Kyle Murchison Booth stories. They're collected in the Bone Key, Unnatural Creatures. And then there's like a handful of them floating around uncollected and somebody should really just do a really, just a gigantic omnibus of the whole thing because they're great. Um, very deliberately began life as a homage, pastiche, but also deconstruction of the antiquarian who has weird things cross his desk and then strange events follow in their wakes. Um, and the, the, those, those are, are almost all very soft-spoken stories. Kyle Murchison Booth is a museum curator with slightly fewer social skills than your average rutabaga um, and a great deal of social anxiety and an unfortunate um, talent for being a weirdness magnet. So he works at the Samuel Mather Parrington Museum and when like cursed objects come into possession of the museum, Booth is always the person who winds up being like, you should deal with this manuscript. It came with some weird conditions in its bequest or I think we have a golem in the basement or possibly someone has been walled up and maybe somebody should look into that. Um, and, and he differs in many ways from your standard Lovecraft or M.R. James narrator among other things, you know, the, the the, the, the social awkwardness, the social anxiety are explicit built into the text rather than being things that you might draw from somebody who, who spends most of their lives in a library wondering what sort of person that is. He's explicitly queer that, that runs against the grain of um, at least verbalizing outright a lot of things which can be implicit in the older generation of stories. But they are soft-spoken horror and they're, and they're very beautifully done and they do have, you know, the standards of here's a weird object or here's a book or here's a story or I ran into this guy and, and yet they don't ever feel like fossilized throwbacks. They, they are very much, they, they were in the vanguard of whatever you want to call sort of the new weird, you know, that radiation which we are now experiencing. Um, and, and um, does it, okay. I, I like I like the I like the quietness and the academia, which has not prevented several of them from registering to me in ways that I do find genuinely horrific. I think that one one thing that I think about when I think about coziness is I think you know when I'm about to go to bed and I want to read something and I do want something to kind of blow my mind just a little bit. 
you know, and the extent that it can be blown with all of my jaded reading, you know, what Robert Aikman story can I read? What, what, you know, who can I, who can I, who, what, what stories can I read that make me just uncomfortable enough, but not like too uncomfortable? When, I, when you say cozy weirdness, Steve, that's what I kind of think of is if you're seeking out weirdness, if you say to yourself, I'm in a mood for weirdness, that's automatically a cozy, right? Because you are looking for that, you know? If you are reading something else and it happens to be weird in a way you didn't expect, again, something like true crime or whatever that has some strange turn that you didn't expect or, or any kind of mystery or whatever, where you're like, yeah, what the hell was that? You know, that's, you know, I, I guess if you're a real purist looking for that mind-blowing moment, you know, probably wouldn't be sitting, you know, it's better to be surprised by the weird than to seek it out, I guess, you know, it's, I, I don't know. Steve, can I ask you why you asked that question, actually? Are you longing for uh, the cozy, or what, what made you think of it? Um, <laughs> because, so I'm, I'm familiar as, as your publisher, I've read all your works. And it's interesting, your, all of you have very, uh, and I've read your, your work that I have not published. So I'm well familiar with all your various stories. And I mean, some are, some could be easily categorized as strange fiction. You know, I mean, some are downright weird. And then, I mean, uh, some are much more fantastical than others. And so I'm just curious that when, um, when you write or when you're writing things, do you have also um, sort of a a sense of how you know what kind of atmosphere I'm my imagination is 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 marinating in that I, that I will then put onto the page, um, and I I find that fascinating and and I I will say that. I, I view also weird fiction often from a nostalgic point of view. That, I mean, when I was, when I was in grade school, then I read a lot of fantasy, like Lloyd Alexander and, and, and um, C.S. Lewis and things like that, because that's, you know, the, the librarian knew I liked monsters, and I knew I liked monsters. And monsters, monsters at that point were incredibly fascinating. But monsters were always the opponent. They were that kind of it was, you know, you. I wanted to, you know, immerse myself into monsters like the world, but I didn't really think like you know, monsters are my friends, things like that. Or I didn't view myself as the monster. Then, once I started reading more sophisticated short stories and learning about that sometimes this who you know what a monster is is vastly different than you know stuff that I would find in the you know Dungeons and Dragons monster manual that there are you know uh, things are unnatural that became really powerful to me. And I admit that that I can think of, you know, the the uh, what was it the is it Martin Greenberg anthologies, you know, um, that helped, you know, I, I how I found Lovecraft, how I found uh, M. R. James, how how I found all these authors was. Even Patricia Highsmith, I, I think it was her Caterpillar story. That was like, the, the, that's the one that I read first. And so, you know, I, I view it as a, through the, the, the veil of nostalgia and that I, I, while I love reading contemporary word fiction, it doesn't bring me back to what I was like as a kid, unless it has this, again, these early trappings of, of, right fireplaces crackling and and people going you know uh you know uh, well i did you read the latest you know coptic manuscript things like that so. 
I think I think for me, you mentioned libraries and how you came upon fiction and horror fiction. For me, at least, it had a lot to do with. I, I didn't discover horror fiction first. I discovered horror nonfiction first. I discovered books about ghosts, about missing people, about UFOs, about, you know, Eric Von Daniken, and all of those sorts of things that were in my elementary school library. And so the threshold I had for believability was very different. I mean, I had a very skewed sense of what, <laughs> after watching episodes of In Search of and going, well, sure, of course, Amelia Earhart became Tokyo Rose. What other plausible explanation could there be? You know, th those kinds of things that have made it kind of hard for me to write anything but that kind of semi-comfortable weird because I, you know, I, my, my imagination doesn't stretch so well to dragons, for example, or to any of these other large concepts. To me, the weird really is, you know, something around a corner that's surprising and kind of challenges your view of the universe. And so it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, those stories being kind of comfortable to you, because I guess that's kind of how, how I started was reading what I thought was true and having that credulity. And that's why it's so hard for me to read stuff now at this age. It's hard for me to, to talk about, here are the authors that can still blow my mind because frankly, I am so jaded and so, it's hard to pull a fast one on me. I'm sorry, I'm sad to say. And usually the stories that do it are ones like, you know, House of Leaves that kind of are structured in ways that aren't like stories, you know. Does that help, Adam? It does. It was great. I mean, one thing that in my fiction, you know, I, everything that I do is kind of an examination of genre, I think. So as you were talking, as everyone's been talking, I feel challenged now to write one of these cozy, uh, weird stories. So you will probably see one from me. <laughs> I would love that. I, 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 I truly, truly would. And, and I'm not surprised, Will, that that is... Um, your foundations, and it's why I, I truly adore, you know, you're one of my favorite writers, so. Uh, we should have an anthology. We should have an anthology. And, Cozy weirdness. <laughs> I, think, I, I think I would have to change the title. I think that, uh, as, <laughs> well, no, no, I think that Sonia, Sonia has mentioned that Cozy does bring up a very- You're right, you're right. You know, from a, from a genre reader, it suggests something different, and, and I guess, mm -hmm. You know, and I certainly don't, I don't want my fiction to be necessarily, you know, constantly heterosexual, yeah. male, white, cisgendered. I, I want, I want the, you know, the freedom of that contemporary authors do have in, in telling their stories. Um, you could have people sitting around at some sort of queer country club place <laughs> talking about all the strange things they've encountered. Well, it's, it's fascinating that, that uh, as this side note is, there was this history of lesbian um, communes and they're all dying out now because people don't want to live off the grid in these communes and so they're run by um, women of, in advanced years. And I just would love to, you know, to hear their stories as like, that would be a wonderful frame, you know, method to, to have them talk about it. And then they could, some of the stories that they're talking about would be women that came in over the years when they were young. Some could be, you know, recent, you know, obviously when you have, um, seniors, you talk about ghosts and death differently. Um, I think that would be a, a, a marvelous anthology there. So, My favorite moment in any relationship of one friend or a group of friends is when they finally start telling each other ghost stories that they think are true. I think about that story by Kelly Link, Two Houses, and I love every, every group of people I know. Eventually, I steer things around to two things. What are your favorite true crime stories? And also, do you happen to believe in the supernatural? What have you experienced? And usually they're, the stories that they tell are truly weird because they don't have a point, right? It's just, hey, you know, I heard, you know, my my, my, first my father or whatever. <laughs> and so I, I think that's, that there's a certain coziness with that too, that re almost relationship building of here is, here's the limits of my reality. What are the limits of yours? What, what you just said about ghost stories not having a point, 
Um, e. Nesbitt published a quantity of horror stories in her lifetime, um, which have since been collected in several different collections. Um, I am, of course, blanking 100% on the title of the one that I happen to own. It's called something like From the Dark. Um, but what one of, one of the things that makes her stories hold up so well to modern readers, or at least the modern reader represented by me, um, is that she really got the quality of ghost stories don't come with neat explanations. There's even one of them which starts by saying this is a real ghost story. And you can tell it's a real ghost story because it's not, she uses the phrase, artistically rounded off. Some wow. things happen in it and they don't all fit together. And I don't even know how to make sense of it, but I know that it happened and I'm going to tell it to you. And, and she, was, she was publishing these in, you know, like the very early 20th century. I think like they're mostly from the 19 teens. Um, but they read now as very strikingly postmodern because they have figured out that if you present a whole bunch of fractured actions that almost but not quite add up to a pattern, it hooks in just like a good Robert Aikman story, the part of your brain that wants to do pattern recognition, that wants to make a coherent narrative, that wants to have it just mean something, but it doesn't mean something, so you're just left with, well, that happens, damn it! <laughs> and and they, they hold up spectacularly for that reason. I, I think that I think also that that's an important component of weird fiction. Mm -hmm. It should not be artistically rounded off. It can be beautifully crafted, but if everything fits together and you can say what everything was doing there and what it all means and all of the details are anatomizable, uh, you probably blew it and just ended up with horror instead. So let's uh, touch upon this. Uh, Tyler will be angry that I don't do all his questions, but that's all right. I'll, I'll pay for it with tuna later. Um, does weird fiction address death differently than horror? Hmm. You mentioned ghost stories. I mean, ghost stories are sort of not always horror. Ghost stories are often referred to as ghost stories. Mm -hmm. um, so. Mm. And there's an overlap between the two genres, so the answers can't be entirely separate, but there's some sort of distinction to be made between stories where death is part of some sort of order. It's because you didn't follow a rule or because you did something that in the story's justice, which may be a terrible justice, means that you need to be punished for it. Versus stories where death is the ultimate indication of non-meaning. I'm thinking about death as kind of the abyss or whatever, and that weird fiction often approaches it through madness maybe. So there's a kind of spiritual death or even like a spiritual enlargement that can happen, but not necessarily a physical death, but they're kind of pointing towards the same thing, right? Um, kind of abyss. And in a lot of stories about deep time, most non-weird fiction horror tends to be very focused on the moment in which you're running and you're scared and something terrible might happen to you now and stories about deep time in weird fiction part of the horror there may be that there comes a time when your life and your death and your species life and death may not even be a footnote <laughs> And that forgetting is a much more important aspect of death and that abyss. Not just dying, but leaving no record whatsoever, since, as we know, humans are so terrific with historical memory anyway. <laughs> hmm. All right. <clears throat> um, I feel like we... <coughs> we sort of touched on Lovecraft a little. And again, he, 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 I feel he needs to be brought up just because, boy, I mean, 
when I was a kid, there was the Lovecraft Circle, and there, <coughs> there, there weren't that many, whereas now it is a huge cottage industry, both for readers and for writers. So, as Tyler says, the temptation to add tentacles to your weird fiction. Should we resist? Should we not? The whys and why nots to, in writing Lovecraftian fiction. He's a cat, so he doesn't always articulate the best. Did you, did you translate that from the original cat? <laughs> kind of I, intervening I, Google well, translate? Well, that, that, he was, it, it was his, it, it, it was from his, his Ulthar memoir, so. Ah, Whoa, nice. see? see? Man, man, you are a Lovecraft fan. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, should we write this stuff? Or are we, you know, I mean, after all, some of you have part of your career, or at least have, you know, written books. Um, in fact, I'm trying to think, Adam, are you the only, you may be the only person on the panel that really hasn't indulged in Lovecraftian stuff. Right. Okay. So are you resisting a temptation to write tentacles, or are you just not inspired to them? I mean, I love, I love H.P. Lovecraft. I've read almost everything that he's written. Uh, I, I get really into the dream cycle stories, you know, the silver key and things like mm -hmm. that. I don't know if there are any, um, there are definitely cats in that, right? But not tentacles necessarily. I don't know. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know that I'm resisting. I'm just, hmm. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I certainly never thought of, thought maybe I should have tentacles in this story. Maybe I shouldn't. You know, there, there are tentacle ideas and there are non-tentacle. That, that's ideas. probably true. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it's worth continuing the conversation both directly and indirectly. And there are times when I want to say something that is best said in response to and with some of the trappings of some of this earlier stuff. <sighs> I mean, my flippant answer is, yes, of course, always add tentacles, but, you know, um, I probably haven't written that many directly tentacular stories myself. My, I'm not one of the people who grew up reading Lovecraft. I actually came to him as an adult, um, or... Oh my god, how do you then still read him? I mean, <laughs> I feel like as an adult, he's almost, you know, it's, you're just like... Why is this guy using every ad adjective in the dictionary and then so Well, I've, I've personally been accused of writing word salad, so that's not going to harm me very much. <laughs> um, I know, I, I, it, it means that I don't have a nostalgic attachment to him, which might possibly have changed how I write about him. The, the one piece of expressly Lovecraftian fiction I have written is basically just a flat-out argument. Um, and, and I think that's very healthy and more people should do that. And it's um, also one of the best Lovecraftian stories that I've yes. read, and I read Lovecraftian stories weekly as a professional thing. It's called All Our Salt, Salt Bottle Hearts. Thank you. Yes, and uh, it's in this book. Um, so so the, the answer like to how I read Lovecraft as an adult is, is I, I, I read things voraciously, and there was something in there that was really interesting to me. A lot of the things that I end up working with are either things that I feel very drawn to or, and I suspect this is common, things that are like pearl grit, things that grate, things that you have to do something with because it keeps scratching at you. And Lovecraft, by, by virtue of his combination of deep time and anxieties, turns out to be a weirdly compelling blend of things where I'm like, oh, that's a neat piece of the universe to noodle around with, and hell no, what was wrong with you? Dude, my grandparents grew up in Brooklyn at the time that you were there. You, they probably weren't too impressed with you either. I bet you were a crappy neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> Muddle, who's the guy next door? He keeps yelling all the time. I, Shana, I have no idea, but he doesn't shut up and he Every never goes Every time he's speaking Yiddish. <laughs> It's terrifying, you know, um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so, so for me, yes, it's worth writing Lovecraftian things because his shadow is 
so huge and because there are so many things in it that are worth examining and worth taking out and sort of plinking at to see what they do or taking out and whacking several times hard against the wall until maybe it stops moving. Um, and I don't, I don't think I particularly worry about whether or not that's a thing I should or should not be doing. Um, I don't tend to worry about my, my, my training for people who have not heard me be on panels or just been around me for five minutes beforehand. Uh, hold on, my computer wanted to update Adobe and I don't want it to do that. Um, my training is as a classicist. Uh, Latin and Greek languages and literature, archaic Greek lyric poetry, my specialty. And so my professional training was, was in things where there is no unproblematic way to engage with any of it. And I, and I think that that was actually very healthy. Um, there's, there's, no, there's no point in like reading Cicero and, and trying to consider him in a modern framework. Um, you probably want to punch him. You might even want to punch him anyway. Lots of people did. He eventually got assassinated. These things happen. Um, and, and so I think that that may have inadvertently primed me to interact with authors who are much closer to me in time in much the same way where it's like, why would you not break this down for parts and try to figure out why they were doing things the way they were doing and look at the nuts and bolts of it? And what are the things that are worth carrying forward into the present and into the kind of future that you want to have? And what are the parts where you're like, yeah, that can stay 2000 years ago. We're, we're, we're all good. Um, that that slut shaming thing you did with Claudia Polkra was absolutely appalling. I don't care that it worked, drop dead. Yeah. I also came to Lovecraft as an adult. I had read sort of para-Lovecraftian things mm. um, in college. You know, they're the Illuminatus trilogy and everyone was playing Call of Cthulhu and making jokes about it. And eventually as an adult, I decided I ought to check this stuff out. And um, I discovered that there were parts that I found really cool and parts that I found funny and parts that I yelled at until I started writing about them. <laughs> and I continue to sometimes want to get into arguments with Lovecraft, but he's dead, so I write stories about those arguments. It's and they're really good. Yes. And, yeah, so... There are, most of what I write is because I'm arguing with something. And there are authors who I hate who I have no desire to get into an argument about. Their stuff doesn't form a pearl around it. It just makes me put down the book. And I think with Lovecraft, it's the combination of the things that are really well done. He, he was coming up with world building ideas that were not like anything else and that still aren't like much else except for things that are trying specifically to be like him and often not succeeding. And then there are the things that are folk art-ish. Mm. Like they're, they're beautiful in their rawness, like the adjectives. I, like, I've read people, try, many people, trying to copy that style, and often their choices of words are comparatively bland. And the thing with Lovecraft's language is that he would, as he boasted, pick the precise right word for the meaning that he meant. And if he meant that meaning 11 times in the same story, he would use Cyclopean 11 times in that story. I counted. <laughs> And then there's the things that are horrible, the, the bigotry that will just either, sometimes it will come out of nowhere, and more often it's so deeply embedded in the world building. And it's embedded in such a way that you can take it and turn it inside out and do cool things with it. It is absolutely canonical in Lovecraft that Cthulhu is the god of the oppressed, of minorities, of basically everyone other than Anglo-colonialists. And for him, that's scary. And for me, that's, well, what sort of religion do you have for 
that is never the religion of the oppressor. <sighs> and that provides comfort in those circumstances. And that still says clearly because no one is getting from Cthulhu the ability to overthrow Lovecraft's family. It, it still tells you that you're stuck in this uncaring universe and that you have to deal with it some way other than going mad because you can't go mad because going mad and living in your basement is a privilege and if you have to keep going out and you know working in the grocery store then you're kind of stuck facing the cosmic horror abyss every day. <laughs> Especially if it's an eldritch grocery store. I mean, right now they're all Eldritch. Yes, that's true. I was I was very lucky that I got to discover Lovecraft in my college library, top floor, flickering lights, middle of the night. When I I started, I went to the I went there at UF every every evening, wandering the the, the rows, looking for the stacks, looking for just you know new things I hadn't experienced, and discovering Lovecraft. I was eighteen, and what was so weird about that. I was pretty sheltered as a high schooler, actually, and so reading it struck me as being very decadent and treacly. It was kind of like almost an Oscar Wilde and this kind of experience, like, who is this person who's just so, you know, outwardly flouting all of the values that everyone holds, you know, to their hearts or whatever. And so it was a very, it was, a, it was kind of this opening of a Pandora's box, I guess, for me. So, so when I think about weird fiction, I think about Lovecraft, I think about you know, for all of his sins, I think, you know, and there are plenty of them, and I don't read this book very often now, <laughs> you know, but when I did read it, it was this revelation to me, and I guess that's probably why he still lodges in everyone's memory, both emotional and intellectual. Well, Adam, have, we, have, have they convinced you to write a Lovecraftian story? <laughs> so each thing we talk about, I will then have to write a story? Okay, yeah. Uh, maybe, yeah, I mean... You I, have I, homework. <laughs> you have homework from this. <laughs> I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so Tyler's next question is... Um, so there's weird fiction, and we've talked about or we've gone around and around because it's sometimes it's hard to define. But then there's this thing that Tyler has heard about called bizarro fiction. So is it just something that was created to give, you know, Algernon Blackwood, you know, apoplexy or is it, you know, what are we, what are our thoughts on bizarro fiction? What are the parameters of bizarro fiction? So we could talk about that. I mean, I, I read somewhere, excuse me, Tyler read somewhere that, you know, one strange thing in a story and it's weird fiction, you know, three or more is, makes it bizarro, which reminded Tyler of the old Universal Mummy movies where it was like so many tan leaves makes the mummy live, but, you know, Nine, give him movement, so. Do you have a classic example of Bizarro? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's Confederacy of Dunces. Really? I thought that was just literary. Can it be, why can it not be both? What is it? Um, let's try, um, the, the people I, I it's John funny. dies at the end. How about that? Ah, uh -huh. yeah. For, for me, I seem to know, I know a lot more people who write bizarro fiction than who read it, which kind of <laughs> yeah, a, a peculiar sense that this may not be taking the world by storm. But to me, it's one of the things, I mean, one of the reasons I'm not, I don't view myself as a horror writer particularly is because I, one thing that kind of puts me off is this strange arms race where, you know, oh, you know, is, is it just one weird thing or is it 15 or is it and just this whole expanding thing where it's kind of like, it's like, like, like porn, like, you know, if you've only watched it once, ooh, it's still tantalizing, but you've got, if you keep doing it, it has to get weirder and weirder and weirder and, you know, and, and I think that, I don't know, it, it's, it strikes me as being kind of, 
you know, I'm sure that there are literary values behind it. The people I know who write it, I respect very much, but, but it seems very much to me to be kind of like almost like a dare, like it's a, like it's a, you know, a gauntlet that someone's throwing down. And again, like I say, if you're thinking about the genre of something when you start it, I don't know, I'm, I'm very suspicious of that. It's just not the way I work. I'm sure other people work differently. But for me, at least, it's always like, eh, you know, if it's accidentally that way, that's, that's one thing. But I don't know, it, 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 it's kind of smacks of that uh, arms race mentality to me. The example, though, of uh, Tom Dies at the End, I, you know, I love that book. Um, I love the feeling of those weird things kind of falling over each other, trying to get out, essentially. You know, there's so many things. I love that kind of frantic feeling. So it seems like uh, if Bizarro can kind of encompass that, uh, you know, just kind of this, this frantic and relentless thing um, that's putting pressure on the protagonist, I think that's fairly exciting, you know. Yeah, kind of like a Hunter S. Thompson Gonzo kind of thing. You know? Yes. Yeah, Instead I, I of being that cozy. It. What was that? I think I have heard it as Gonzo fiction at some point. Yeah, 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 yeah. That kind of, yeah. Other thoughts? I mean, you don't have to like everyone. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I have enough familiarity with examples of this genre to have an opinion about it. I, I, I can definitely think of some stories I've read in which a great deal of weirdness is piled on top of rather more weirdness with some weirdness on top, but I'm not sure that it would have occurred to me to classify it as an actual separate subgenre, um, or I would probably have, have defined it by whatever the prevailing mode was in which the weirdness was happening. Um, like one of, the, one of the stories that Ruthanna, you and, and Anne reviewed within the last couple of months, I think, although again, you know, time turned into an accordion, so I'm not totally sure, um, was uh, Fiona Geist, um, this is terrible, I'm going to blank on the title. Red um, something, yeah. Red, red Stars, White Snow, Black Metal. I may have gotten that, red I may have gotten some of the color words wrong. Metal, yes. it, it's, it's, a, it's a magnificent, weird gonzo journalism story. Um, it's found in the anthology Ashes and Entropy, edited by Robert S. Wilson from Nightscape Press. Um, and it is a story in which a great deal of weirdness happens. The, the protagonist is a journalist who gets put onto a story about some kind of black metal event thing happening in in Europe um, and like her job has just detonated and this is the, the story she's being given a lifeline to so she goes and starts following it and finds herself progressing you know increasingly into the former Soviet bloc with you know fascists and political lesbians and Russian futurist opera and um, incomprehensible things from outside reality which also happen to look like design elements from the original futurist production of the opera Victory Over the Sun um, and the whole thing just it just concatenates like there are Lovecraftian qualities there are you know um, Carcosan aspects um, I mean the thing with the Russian futurist is that it's based around a quite real opera which personally I happen to adore uh, I believe the black metal groups are fictitious, but I'm actually not going to swear to that. And the entire thing does turn into this giant katamari of, you know, what the fuck? Um, but it would probably not have occurred to me to categorize it as bizarro fiction rather than like weird fiction about a gonzo journalist with Russian futurists. Yeah, that's exactly the story that I was thinking of too. I was thinking if I've read bizarro fiction, then I would guess that guy's story is it, but I'm not sure if using Hunter S. Thompson as a comparison and then using a Hunter S. Thompson, King and Gello mashup as an example. Like, I don't know if it needs a subgenre for Yeah. Some. I, 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 I'm trying to remember if Nick Malatas would consider some of his stuff bizarro or whether he would be angry at, if I made that. Was he one of the editors of the anthology, The Urban Bazaar? When that mm -hmm. happened in like 2004, 2005, I associate him with it. Mm. Um, all right, well, let, um, let me uh, discuss one other thing. Um, probably most people are, uh, think of Lethe Press as uh, queer speculative fiction. Um, 
three out of four of my panelists, you know, you can guess which one is not. No, um, is our 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 LGBTQ plus etc. Um, the other is an ally who has written queer speculative fiction. Um, is do you think that um, the weird is is an ideal home for queer spec fic? And that is there some benefit to to being queer um, or not so much benefit? I will say yes. There's always lots of benefits. You know, if you're if if you date someone, you you could double your outfits. You know, things like that. No, um, but is there an ease to writing queer weird fiction that maybe science fiction or fantasy does not have to it? Um, just your thoughts. So I've always felt like the weird was particularly connected again to my point of view. You know, I grew up in a small um, conservative town in Ohio and I just, you know, well, I felt weird, uh, but I also felt that distinction between surface and depth. Uh, you know, and I'm thinking about someone like Sherwood Anderson, who is not really a, a weird writer, but he kind of is in some ways, you know, so um, I think that that, that, that skewed my percep perception or maybe um, opened my eyes in certain ways, just that experience of growing up. So it feels like that is where I belong. That is where I feel comfortable. I've written queer weird fiction and queer science fiction and queer fantasy. Um, I think speculative fiction in general, at least for me, is a good home for queerness. It certainly reflects my way of seeing and interacting with the universe better than mimetic fiction, which I think I may have written one three-page story once in college. It's just not the way that my brain works. Um, but in terms of the various genres and subgenres within speculative fiction, um, they all get at different things. And for me, at least, weird fiction is not queerer than things that don't quite fall in that box, although there are many excellent queer weird fiction authors as there are many excellent queer spec fic authors in general. I, I tend to think of it also as being more like the default filter that is going to affect whatever I write. Um, I, I have not, I think, ever written mimetic fiction. Um, I do have a thing that I'm working on which appears to contain no fantastic supernatural mythological weird elements whatsoever, uh, but it's lesbian pulp, so maybe that answers the question. Um, I don't... I do find weird fiction a very congenial genre to be in. It's one that I wasn't particularly aware of um, as such for most of my writing life. Um, it, I probably started to become really aware of it when people started identifying me as a writer of it. But it does seem to triangulate and concentrate a lot of, the, a lot of concerns and a lot of the things in which I'm interested in. Um, recently, when asked what kind of fiction I write, I have started saying that I'm a liminal writer. This, this is my mother's definition, and I really like it, so I'm going to keep using it. And the weird is a very, very good space for liminal things. And, and I like all of that. And that does make it, so I don't, I don't know, I, I'm not going to say that makes it feel home-like, because again, the entire point of the weird is that it is unheimlich. So like, if you get really comfortable in it, again, you, you probably just screwed it up. Um, I don't necessarily tie that to that part of my identity as a queer writer specifically though. I think that it's more just like the gestalt of whatever I ended up with finds this particular way of looking at the world to be really fruitful and really interesting and apparently the way that I bend naturally. I think for me, I, I boy, this is, man, I, I, I feel that I, this is one place where you think, well, as the, as the straight white guy, I should probably shut the hell up. But being a straight white guy, I cannot resist. Um, no, I'm just teasing. What, what, I was, what I will say is this, what I have written, 
the reason the reason that I have a certain affinity for 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 for, for you know, LGBTQ plus protagonists in my fiction is that when I am writing about the strange, I am looking for someone mm -hmm. protagonist who has a certain amount of internal otherness, a certain amount of perceptiveness, a certain amount of like <laughs> carefulness about the world that they live in, because. It's harder for me, like, and, and it's something that I share, given the way I was, I was raised in peculiar circumstances that have made me a lot like that, kind of a little bit, bit feeling like an outsider and not, I mean, obviously not even comparing <laughs> in any accurate way, but I always, you know, part of what, you know, I think about when I'm writing about, you know, something that's strange is who do I know that that would perceive this in a way that's the most interesting and would get the most and see this from as many possible angles and i find it hard even as a person who is you know you know, you know cis you know someone like me who would just not take everything for granted you know what i mean so that's why when i write about protagonists that are like that i'm always thinking to myself who who isn't going to take this for granted? Who doesn't take their environment for granted and their world for granted? You know, because that's not, it's not made necessarily for them. That's kind of what I, when I, when I write those characters, that's what I think to myself. So I, I will say that um, I think that while the, the weird to me seems more, seems a more apt home for my interest sensibilities than say straight science fiction or fantasy is because growing up I did not see queer characters in those fields and while yes I you know I always had an instinct to write the stories that I wanted to see or to read but at some point I was just like you no know, the knight with the, you know, facing off against the, the demon lord dragon, that's, that's not my story. That, that is, you know, courtly love and all those medieval trappings are so, you know, knowing that you know, people would be killed for being gay. And, and science fiction, again, was, was, that was not my society. That was not my role. And so weird fiction seems always a much more non-society basis. It's not a community. It is, it is an individual situation to me. It is me against the world, me encountering the strangeness that happens. There may be other people that are drawn into it, but it is not a... I, I rarely think of it as a shared world experience that fantasy and science fiction often has. And so um, I don't know if you have further thoughts on this. I think that the idea of the weird as marginalized literature is very definitely fruitful. Ruthana talking about Cthulhu as the god of the oppressed, you know, fits in with that. But also, there is an entire weird fiction community, or we wouldn't all be hanging out in, in our house on, on Zoom having conversations about this, uh, at least semi-confident in, in the knowledge of an audience of people who will actually tune in and, and see a lot of, of weird writing shut-ins talking to one another. <laughs> so, I, 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 think, I think that I, I, also, Ruthanna, when you referred to as, as Lovecraft as outsider art, or I think you called him folk art. Well, um, outsider art is actually the term I was looking for. <laughs> okay, you know, and, and I, think, I think that there is, I, I think there is a big strain of that in the genre, and I think that it is a genre that is friendly to people just crashing in out of nowhere with, you know, their own protocols. Um, but I do think that the idea of it being something that is experienced singly or that really can't be shared, like that may be true of the characters, like you just had some kind of imminent experience of the universe, it, it does not matter how, how eloquently you gibber at like the next guy over at the club, it's probably not really going to come through. Um, but I'm, but I'm, not, I'm not totally persuaded by the argument that the weird itself is is a thing that now that, that that occurs now you know only in isolation um 
I, I, I am always interested by what happens when something that has been on the margin suddenly smacks into the mainstream. And certainly I think Lovecraft has, it would probably horrify him, but that's okay. I'm fine with being horrified, gone mainstream. I mean, I bought, like we're, we're talking years ago now, I bought a, a, a plush Cthulhu for so, so, so I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, my point was not the genre is, 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 uh, you know, not a shared community, but the experiences in the fiction, the, the point of like the weirdness of the fiction, I feel like, at least in mine, the more people that experience the weird, the less weird it gets. I'm not sure I agree with that at all. I mean, even, even Lovecraft's own fiction contains entire communities of people oriented around some damn weird stuff. Now, to Lovecraft, they're horrifying and they're antagonists and like, it's absolutely fine if the feds roll them all up and, you know, take them off God knows where. Uh, we're, we're, we're all apparently cool with that, aren't we? Um, but but there but it's it's not like a genre necessarily even from the, the start full of solitary practitioners and and that actually is an aspect that really interests me like uh, it, it there is a strand and i think it tends to be what i work with more than not of like one person coming up against some kind of weird experience but but you you do get stories of communities either where this is normal or where this isn't and like here i think is where weird kind of starts to bleed over into folk horror which is absolutely a community-based genre you know where you the normie are the outsider and you come in and everybody is like what do you mean you don't make corn dollies and make sacrifice to the harvest gods what, what what's wrong with your family you know um but but you do get communities in these narratives and there are ways in which that it feels kind of unexplored to me. Like, Ruthanna, you explore that. I think that's awesome. Um, but I'm, I'm having a hard time thinking of a lot of other currently written weird fiction, which looks at what happens when groups get involved in the weird quite the same way. And it's not, again, the traditional, you know, well, we're a Satanist cult, how about you? I'd, I'd like to see more of that. I'm very interested in communities in weird fiction, too. And I th in fact, I think one of the places where it's, can be very queer is people having these experiences alone and then meeting other people who have had those experiences and starting to form community around that. I can't think of a lot of stories around community, but starting even back with Lovecraft, there are a lot of protagonists who have one friend that they can trust, possibly because you need that framework of who are you telling this thing to, or sometimes the framework of who do you trust enough to follow them down into that weird hole that you maybe shouldn't go into, but they are telling you about the amazing things to be discovered, and there you go. <laughs> There's a Caitlin Kiernan story called Onion, um, which has uh -huh. been collected a couple of times. I think it was originally published in Wrong Things. Um, it's collected into Charles Fort with Love, I'm pretty sure. Um, and it is definitely in one of the giant best of collections from Subterranean, which is about um, people who belong to a support group for people who have had some kind of otherworldly encounter. Um, it focuses specifically on, on a couple, Frank and Willa, um, who, have, who each have very, very different encounters. Like Frank's was when he was, I think, seven years old, he, he found a field full of cinnamon-colored grass behind the wall in the basement of the apartment building that he grew up with, and that has haunted him forever. He still dreams of it. Um, we don't know for most of the story what Willa's other wear is, but it turns out to be something that she can actually access. Um, it's a kind of, of underwater plane, and it, it shows up. It, it floods their bathroom at one point in the story. And, and they have, di it, it, one of the points of the story is that they have diametrically opposed emotional reactions to being plugged into this system of people who see things that most of the time aren't there, but sometimes really are. Frank is willing to do almost anything, never to dream of or be haunted by the possibility of encountering that field of cinnamon colored grass again. Whereas, as Willa finally explains, the possibility that that sea world will sweep her up at any moment, any time, she can't predict it, but it could be there, is really the only thing that keeps her getting up in the morning. But 
you do have an entire support group of people who like meet in the basement of a synagogue and you know like somebody brings you know donuts and there's coffee and people always stand up and make sort of AA like speeches about their weird experiences of which you just get these little fragments in the story enough to build the idea of this entire permeable porous world we live in through which strange stuff is always falling. And, and I love that story in part because it, it does show like what happens when you get a community of people who weird things have happened to and what they have in common is the commonality of the weirdness, but nobody has the same experience. So they don't share anything specifically, which is a distinction that I love. That sounds amazing. And I can't believe I've never read it. You should read it. That reminds me, um, Will, you did the, you had your wonder scouts, your 40 and scouts. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's that sense of people exploring the strange who have very different perceptions of it. Mm. Yeah. Talk about this. <laughs> no, it's, it's a, it basically, it takes place in the 20s. Charles Fort starts a different type of Boy Scout troop called the Wonder Scouts. And so he's doing his research in the, uh, the library. He recruits a small number of boys, including one kid who's the son of immigrants from Norway. And they go on a camping trip. And during the camping trip, they, Fort, of course, has this very expansive view of all of the wondrous liminal things they're going to discover there. And one of the kids just finds a body. <laughs> and so the kid who's more practical and focused on an actual crime that's happened is one type of experience. And then the other kids kind of have these other more, um, you know, supernatural kinds of experience. So it's, I, I and that, that's something I think that I, I always flirt with because I, I'm always, I'm fascinated by not only by the people who are really perceptive of things like that, but also the people who are really tone deaf to that, you know, who see the wondrous pass them by and are like, whoa, whoa, where was that? You know, those people amaze me too. Like the people who kind of are in the between, that's fine. But I, I'm, I'm almost as fascinated by the people who have either suppressed or b deliberately blinded themselves from the strange but uh, yeah so i tend to write about those kinds of things and I, I think the other thing too with fort was that you know and and with him as a human being was that he was obsessed with finding actual quantifiable evidence and he never ever found it he never had that experience himself he only had it second third fourth fifth hand and that's kind of the tragedy of the story is that he doesn't experience any of it so. mm -hmm. well um now we've come to the part of like many panels um i'd like it i'd like you to make a a recommendation of some weird fiction that you particularly like just um one title uh doesn't have to be a book um and certainly it does not have to be a lefe press title etc oh wow <laughs> i know it's hard to believe that people read outside their the, the publisher it there it really, you know, so um and it does not have to ha involve cats either so that is oh okay so that, are you just going to walk out of the room now? No. Yeah, you'll have to come back to me last because both of mine were from that. I always do. <laughs> all right, Adam, your thoughts. Darn it. I was trying to look up mine right now. Yes. All right, all right. I'll go back. Up. I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. Uh, it is uh, Reza Nagarastani's Cyclonopedia. Uh, I really like it. Uh, very kind of postmodern uh, approach to H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. Uh, you know, the feeling, at least, that H.P. Lovecraft expresses. Um, if you know um, the, the, the kind of book of philosophy called, uh, is it The Dust of This Planet? Do you know that? Um, I do not. Well, anyway, that's an awesome piece of, like, weird philosophy, to The Dust of This Planet. Um, right now, I'm blanking on who wrote it, and I can't look it up. So. Well, you, I'll tell you what. Walt Disney. If we continue on, you, you, could, you, could you repeat the title? Because it, it happened very fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the first one was Reza, R-E-A-R-E-A, -E Nagarastani, uh, and it's called uh, Cyclon Cyclonopedia. Uh, and the other one is uh, The Dust of This Planet. And I'll look it up. Cool. All right. Sonia? Uh, okay, so in, in addition to the things that I've just been flinging wildly at people, um, there are two novels... Um, by an author named William Sloan. One is To Walk the Night from 1937. The other is The Edge of Running Water from 1939. 
They were collected under the title The Rim of Morning, which is how you can get them in a rather snazzy paperback from the New York Review of Books, um, like possibly with a, a foreword by Stephen King, although I might be making that up. Um, they are really, really interesting novels to me because if you read them now, what they look like are cutting edge fusions of noir fiction and cosmic horror. But as previously mentioned, the dates were 1937 and 1939. They were written before either of these genres was even properly codified. And what they tell you is how interrelated pulp fiction at that time was. They're beautifully written. Um, the, the, the former is, the former is in some ways an entirely viable retelling of The Little Mermaid only with much more deep time and deep space and alienness and non-humanness all around. Um, the second one is the sort of parapsychological fringe science horror weird fiction that until I read this novel, I hadn't thought was really a thing until like the 1970s. Um, they, they're, they have gorgeous prose styles, very, very crystalline. They have narrators who present themselves as transparent prose and both dudes are 100% wrong about this. They are not impartial. They are not disconnected. They are not merely relaying the story to you. One of them, in fact, really needs to get the hell out of his own way right now, maybe yesterday. Um, I love when you become ebullient about, about <laughs> books. So. They're, they're, they're just terrific. Um, I, I, I believe Lila Garrett Wexnor recommended them to me and there's still, I still haven't really found anything like them because all of the other cosmic noir that I've read has been decades later and is pastiches or rediscoveries and these were written at a point in time when these two genres could just be the same stream. They're, they're really stunning and also quite pleasantly considering that I've been hammering on the fact that they were written in 1937 and 1939. They're surprisingly good about women. Um, the, the significant female character in, in the first one, um, if the novel had been tilted just a little toward what we think of as the familiar tropes, would be, you know, like a femme fatale monster or something, and she is in fact the most sympathetic character in the entire thing. And that's just a pleasure to read in any decade, but, you know, especially nowadays when we need all the reminders that we can get that the past was not as cis-heteronormative conservative as some people would like us to believe before we all wink out. It's a nice thing to, to see. I recommend this. All right. Adam, did you find the author? Yeah, it's Eugene Thacker. So the title is In the Dust of This Planet, Ooh. or of Philosophy. It's awesome. That's a great title. Yeah. Where's that at? So I'm going to start by, because it's very hard to pick one, by cheating and saying that the Lovecraft reread has several years worth of recommendations and anti-recommendations for several good things. And then I'm going to, um, I do recommend um, Mira Grant's In the Shadow of Spindrift House, which is a novella out from Subterranean Press sometime in the last year, but time is meaningless. Um, and it is, you know, my, my favorite sub, sub, sub genre is deconstructions of The Shadow of Rinsmith. Um, and this is a deconstruction of The Shadow of Rinsmith that asks what it would take to make the ending of that story unambiguously horrific. Mm. Now, for those who aren't familiar, this is a story that ends up with the main character joining this community of monsters and living forever underwater. It's terrible, um, mm. according to Lovecraft. So, and the way in which Mira Grant, who is not so secretly Sean McGuire, makes that ending terrible is by making the whole thing a crossover with Scooby-Doo. Ah! And it's this legitimately horror 
amazing group of friends dealing with this thing where you pull off the mask and it's still Cthulhu underneath and it is it, it is wonderful both on its own and in conversation with the genre. Hmm. Will. Oh, sorry. Will? Um, I will slightly cheat and do one publisher and one book. Right. A publisher, I mean, assuming you've read everything that Lethe Press puts out, which it's, it's a lifetime of, of achievement for you. <laughs> if you've done that, there's a press called Valancourt Press that out of Richmond, Virginia, that is doing wonderful reprints of some amazing semi-forgotten books. I mean, so there's Charles Beaumont, things like that that are not as forgotten, but some amazing writers and, and, and books that, that are there. Um, and then the book I'll recommend, it's a, it's a strange outlier, I think. It's not something people would normally say is weird fiction, but it's a book that made me feel the most profoundly out of place and weird of any book I've ever read. And it's Patricia Highsmith's This Sweet Sickness. And the protagonist is a man madly in love with his ex-girlfriend who has gotten married and is starting another life. But he, in the back of his mind, has built this, he, like he's bought another house for them. He imagines this whole other life that he has built for them together. And these two worlds, the real world and the world he thinks is going on, are slowly colliding. And the whole thing about it, I love when people are wrong about the world, you know, because it's kind of a wish, right? You know, being wrong is a wish in a way of what you want it to be. And so this book has this, this horrifying collision of the real and what his imagined. And I don't know, it, maybe it just was the time I read it, you know, or whatever, but that book just like, it, it, it's the only book I've ever read that, that provoked a physical reaction in me of just being like, God, oh, what am I wrong about? It's, what am I imagining? And so it's, it's you know, Hi, Patricia Highsmith, of course, amazing writer, you know, the Ripley books, of course, are astounding, but this, this book took it to another level. So yeah, this sweet sickness, I would heartily recommend. I, I, I cannot, uh, say enough good things about Valancourt. Um, and they're also two gay men. Uh, who, yeah, yeah. See, that's why you really see- I've, given, I've like given them a lot of money, so <laughs> I, mean, yeah, like, I, I, I have love, a whole shelf of their stuff. I, I love Valancourt books, and they've done some terrific work getting um, these, the semi, like you said, semi-forgotten books back into print and all that. Steve, could you could you say a couple titles? I just read a Valancourt uh, book. I read J.B. Priestley's *The Benighted*, uh, which is the basis for James Whale's, uh, you know, 1930s movie *The Old Dark House*. And I have to say, *The Benighted* is one of the most amazing horror novels. I've ever read. So, um, yeah. the last book of theirs that I that I read was not was not. Um, I wouldn't call it a genre title. It was called The Wrong People. Um, and uh, let, me, let me find the, the author. He's people. Uh, it, it's this horrible thing about um, um, this schoolmaster, British schoolmaster goes on holiday in Morocco and he's he's a pederast and he falls in with this bizarre pederast scheme um, and uh, so it's by uh, Robin Mom, who is uh, related to Somerset Mom, um, and it's just it's what I love about it is it's full of really ugly people and in this sort of forbidden world and the the main character knows that his desires you know are are viewed as terrible by society and it's it, it, it's how he deals with you know, his obsessions and, and how he's in some ways powerless to resist his urges, but it's not, um, you know, it's certainly not what I would consider um, pornographic by, to, certainly by today's standards, but when it was published in 67, I mean, it was like, oh my God. So, 
Um, so that is one of theirs that that is great. Wrong people. I mean, I I would go to their website and just yeah, you, you could throw their... a dart and hit a great book. I mean, L. P. Hartley's The Vanishing, uh, the uh, the Traveling Grave is a great one. That's a great re-release. Um, they did. Um, was it a Blackwater Wonder. Summer? I'm sorry. Was it Blackwater Summers? Yeah, I mean, they, yeah, I I don't have them off the top of my head, but that, that's just the the L. P. Hartley came to mind, and yeah, there's a, there's several. They're they're extraordinary. They have excellent taste. Yes. All right. Well, thank you all four of you for spending your time with me discussing weird fiction. Um, I hope that uh, I hope that people who are watching this video get, you know, whether they get a better sense, a worse sense. Yeah. You know, <laughs> One thing I know for sure is I am never reading that shit ever. <laughs> <laughs> as someone backing away from their computer right now. <laughs> also, Steve, we now have it recorded with like, you know, multiple witnesses that you're going to edit that anthology, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, oh, the my cozy horror? My yeah, cozy which needs a different name, but come on. In the arms of Cthulhu. <laughs> <laughs> Grandma Beatrice, you know, meets, in, goes to Innsmouth. The Hallmark Channel presents... <laughs> Well, all right, everyone. I, I actually really want someone to write Hallmark Dagon now. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, we'll see. We'll see. So, uh, everyone, wave to the camera. And yeah. thank we'll, you so much, Steve. Thanks so much. It was my thank pleasure. My this. pleasure. Take care, uh, everyone. Bye. Right. Goodbye. See you.